Hello everyone, my name is Akal and I am a somatic therapist and astrological counselor. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about the work I do, you can check out my website, which I have posted down below the video. So today, I'm going to talk about the sun. Um, so the sun is, is uh, it's interesting, like I think most of the time, most of us when we get into astrology, this is initially what we end up looking at is uh, I'm a sun in Taurus or I'm a sun in Leo or whatever it may be. Um, and oftentimes we just kind of glaze over the rest of the chart because the sun is a extremely, uh, well, extremely noticeable and potent energy in our life because it is kind of like, uh, well, it basically represents what animates our existence. Um, and that's a little bit vague, I understand. But the sun in and of itself is both, in my opinion, both vague as well as overt and obvious. Uh, basically, what I mean by that is, is that you have the three qualities of all, you know, of all creation, basically, which is uh, the energy of creation, the energy of destruction, and then the preservation force. Um, and so these three forces are all represented by the sun. And the idea here is, is that the creative energy which flows into uh, the material plane begins to animate our reality. It brings life into existence. And then, like I said, the continuous rays of the sun, as they persevere throughout, I guess, throughout all creation as we know it, uh, ends up preserving our reality. However, if the sun becomes small and withdraws its rays, then destruction and death will follow. So we are in every way, shape, and form dependent on the sun. So the gunas, or I guess the fundamental energies that underlie all creation, once again, uh, for the sun are interesting to me uh, because what they are on, on a sort of basic fundamental level, um, on a sort of foundational, and again, when I'm talking about the sun in this reference, I'm referring to the kind of template of the mind. You know, if you were to create a matrix or a construct of what the mind would look like, you would have sophic, rajasic, and tamasic as three energies that intertwine and basically in, in combination, it, I'll show you this in a moment, um, but in combination, these three forces, they come together and they basically create the mind as we know it. So the sattvic quality of the mind is what underlies the archetype of the sun in one's birth chart. Uh, sophic energy is that of harmony, balance, clarity, uh, because the sun represents everything. It is non-dual in nature, so hence sophic. Uh, meaning it possesses all negative aspects of humanity and all positive aspects of humanity. All negative aspects of the mind, all positive aspects of the mind are always in every, in every way rooted in solar energy. So it is sophic energy, like I said, on its impersonal mind, on its deep underlining vibe. Then it's rajasic or the positive mind, meaning it's flowing, it's attaching, it's action oriented, it's moving toward, um, towards goals, it's proactive. Uh, and I'll get in, in, towards the end of this move, end of the, excuse me, end of this video, I will get into the more specific, uh, I guess, more specifically of what happens when the sun or when this rajasic energy um, is not expressed let's say, in a clear way. Um, what happens when the individual is unbalanced? How does this energy then express? Yogi Bhajan says that the positive mind is what gives us, in quote, positive mind gives the quality of action, involvement, and passion. So when you're looking into your birth chart, you know, regardless of what the placement is, uh, let's say it's in a particular house. Uh, you know, let's say it's in the third house. Now, let's say sun in the third house is going to bring a certain amount of passion to one's communications, how one expresses themselves out into the world, uh, short distance traveled, all sorts of other sort of associations with the third house. So 
uh, again, just kind of keeping it very generic, if you look at this idea of um, one's life purpose, which is also expressed by the sun, so you're going to see one's life purpose, one, one's life purpose, one's proactive activities, one's passions, one's, I mean, how we involve ourselves in the world. Wherever your sun sits in your chart is going to show, um, essentially, that energy is going to be expressed through that area, that particular house. So, uh, let's see. So creative self-actualization. Um, creative self-actualization, integrative principle, our purpose, uh, all these basically are expressing uh, the, the same idea, which is um, it is the life force that is driving us and moving through us that often we aren't even operating on a conscious level with that's driving a lot of our actions. And I won't say these are the desires necessarily. Um, desires, we tend to look at Venus, we tend to look at Mars, we tend to look at even on a deep level Pluto, which represents kind of like a soul's desire from a past life. What we end up having with the sun is this is the life force. This is what we are actualizing in this lifetime. This is what is being expressed on a broad level in this lifetime. So the best way that the sun functions is if we can understand a very basic, simple principle. Um, I like to repeat this to myself all the damn time, just as a reminder, which is we shine from the inside out. So meaning, if one's consciousness is cluttered, if one's consciousness is, let's say, burdened by untruths, uh, burdened by guilt, shame, etc., or if we are simply operating inauthentically, then what ends up happening is we get the more negative manifestations of the sun. So the more negative manifestations of the sun could be like narcissism, uh, dictatorial behavior. Uh, let me read out some other ones here. It says, you know, the tendency towards bad timing, preachy, pushy, impatient, poor judgment. So meaning there's a, lar there's a large amount of life force behind this. And I thought it was really interesting that in a lot of the things I was reading, there's this association with uh, time as it relates to the sun, because the, the sun in a lot of ways dictates our cycles in this life. And it's these cyclical rhythms that we, uh, I guess we learn to, well, we don't really learn to work with them, at least not in modern day times, but uh, we have like these uh, controlled environmental conditions that we exist in now, at least in, you know, where I live. So what ends up happening with the sun is, is that it, historically speaking, it dictated how we planted our crops. It dictated when we harvested our crops. It dictated so much about one's life. So again, on an astrological level, how we end up perceiving this in our, in our existence is the cyclical patterns of the body itself and that you know our bodies also change with the seasons but I thought more interestingly was on a very deep level the Sun is linked to kind of a very deep intuition and when we pay attention to this deep intuition the reason why I say intuition is remember that the Sun is sophic on its deep impersonal mind level and that sophic represents intuition in a lot of ways. Intuition is beautiful because it transcends time and space. It essentially makes you a time travel traveler. So if you, uh, let's say, are following your, your intu intuitive instinct, what ends up happening is that you're given information or you download information, and this information will allow you to, I guess, move through pitfalls it can literally see into the future. It can see, and again, what is correct for your energy. So I keep bringing up this term authentic. Um, authenticity to me, just, uh, just to clarify what I mean by that word, authenticity to me is when, I guess that, that idea that we shine from the inside out, it means that our internal, I guess our internal, um, our internal ruminations and our internal understanding and our internal connection to intuition and instinct is in harmony with what we're expressing out into the world. And that's what I mean by authentic. Uh, another way that we can look at this idea of authenticity um, as it relates to the sun, uh, and I'll go ahead and read a quote. Um, this is from Bepin Bahari. And the quote is, it says, the total 
quantum of divine energy flowing through different levels of the individual and the quality of its manifestation. Very wordy. Uh, basically, what he's in referring to is this, this symbol. So the symbol of the sun is a big circle with a dot in the middle. Now, the dot in the middle represents, as I perceive it, the infinite. It represents source. And how we experience the infinite in the source within our existence, to make this relevant to each of us, is consciousness itself. It's presence itself. So it's not something you can look at. It's not something you have any idea of because it has no dimension. It's a dot. Again, that's just the representation. But even a dot, as we would draw it, has dimension. So immediately, this is just a, a bad representation of, of the reality, which is that this is immeasurable. So now where we can interact and we can measure is the circle or the outer ring, uh, the circumference of the circle. So what we see here is the arc of our lifetime in a lot of ways. We see, you know, you can look at the arc that the sun follows through the constellations as it, you know, goes through, you know, the sky at different times of year, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what we're actually looking at here is this, this circle represents the totality of all that is manifest. That is, everything in creation is in some ways tied to that dot. So this dot is basically expanding outward uh, until it doesn't. And whether it contracts, I don't know. But this idea is that this circle can get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's just simply that the radius changes. Again, what's most important to understand is that this idea that the manifest is rising out of a void, essentially. So the ascendant in the sun in combination are actually really interesting. Uh, this is something that kind of like I read in one of my books and I thought it was, I thought it was interesting because it's nothing that I actually really pondered before. So the ascendant and the sun actually very much work together. And the sun itself, again, like I've mentioned before, is the totality of all the energy that's moving through us. It is the life force that is ultimately driving us through life. It is our purpose. It is our self-actualization. It is our creativity. It is self-expression. It is pretty much, like I said, the totality of our existence. Uh, the other planets basically give us nuance. So the Ascendant in the Lord is uh, essentially, I guess, the tendencies? I, I think that's the best way. To, so the Ascendant and the Ascendant Lord are the tendencies that we express externally throughout our life. So, um, and I don't want to get into much detail, that's another video is when I go over the Ascendant more specifically, but the sun, again, represents our overall sort of expression, and, uh, but again, it, this idea we shine from the inside out, and the Ascendant is essentially the tendencies or the energies that we bring into all life's endeavors. And all life's endeavors are represented by the 12 houses of the wheel. Uh, or if you're using Vedic astrology, I guess the square or whatever else. So again, those two do work in harmony. So the final thing I want to talk about, I want to talk about Yogi Bhajan's uh, association with the sun, uh, what he calls aspect six. Uh, aspect six or the missionary. Um, I thought missionary was, it's kind of confusing term initially. Like I, I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, that sounds more like Jupiter. Um, but as I kind of looked into why he called it the missionary, it sort of made progressively more sense to me. Uh, the idea is um, the word mission. So life purpose, mission, missionary. Uh, it's just that in our, I guess in our culture, we have tend to associate missionary with some sort of religious, um, religious motivation. So Again, in this particular case, what we're talking about is the combination between sophic energy, which is discernment, uh, and proactive energy, the, action, the energy of activity and action. So it's about becoming, and again, as this aspect six or the missionary is cultivated through the exercise, which I'm going to demonstrate at the end of this video, the exercise will help you cultivate neutral mind, discernment, 
so that you can express from the inside out authentically. Again, we shine from the inside out. And as you express from the inside out authentically, you essentially reduce karma. Karma is created, you know, will reduce the karma that is created as well as you sort of diffuse past karmas uh, that you may be carrying into this lifetime. Uh, now I read another quote from Yogi Bhajan. It is, you feel that the infinite will and yours act together. That's another way of saying authentic expression. So with all that said, I'm going to go ahead and show you now how I connected the sun as it's understood through natal astrology to the missionary or aspect six. All right, so here's Yogi Bhajan's book, The Mind. Mine is tattered. And in the back of this book is my favorite part of the book, which is the flow chart. So what this flow chart is showing, again, it says the universal mind, chitta. And we have the three basic qualities that exist in all creation and all nature, which is tamasic, which is like inertia, rajasic, which is action or attaching energy, and sophic, which is neutral, clarity, harmony, balance. Now with the sun, we had sophic energy on its base, and then it flows downward to the positive mind or the missionary. So that is aspect six, the missionary. Then what we do is we flip through the book. We find aspect six. Here's the qualities. And the meditation, which is the Kundalini Yoga Leya meditation. And here's the meditation itself. And it's done for 31 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead in the next segment, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do this. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do uh, Aspect 6, the missionary or the Leia, the Kundalini Yoga Leia meditation. So this particular exercise, um, it sort of epitomizes in a lot of ways uh, the sort of idea of spiritual pressure, of how one moves, at least energetically, how we move towards enlightenment, uh, at least through technique. So, and again, the assumption here, the technique in and of itself isn't the point. That's one thing it needs to be said, is that it's always about the meditation. It's always about, uh, you know, the progression towards enlightenment is always through contemplation, concentration, meditation. And what I mean by meditation has to do with surrender. So this is about precise action. And this is one of the reasons I think the word yoga is really interesting is it's the idea of to bring something into, into union or to yoke something. So bringing something into union, well, what exactly are we bringing into union? In this particular case, and within the case of all technique within any yogic system, the point is always about concentration. It's about essentially bringing your awareness to either many small points or a singular point, and then letting go into open awareness and to surrender and to allow life force and energy simply to flow. So with this particular meditation, uh, like I said, it kind of epitomizes this idea of the pressure gradient that exists within. And so in order for us to have experiences, in order for us to, uh, let's say, purge patterns, uh, one of the things that you can do is that you stimulate the nervous system in a very precise way. In the stimulation, the nervous system sends a signal to the subconscious that it's okay to let something go. Because again, everything that functions within the human, um, within human awareness really has to do with well, the awareness itself. And what I mean by that is, is that if something is in the shadows, we don't liberate ourselves from it until, well, it's no longer in the shadows. Meaning it's been brought to our awareness either through um, our own sort of process of contemplation or somebody, well, or the universe somebody, life, 
showed us what we needed to see and what we needed to perceive. And again, everything is really about growth from point A to point B, from birth to death. It's about this progression of growth or not growth if we're not growing. So this, this exercise, like I said, it's what it's going to be done. It's going to be initiated from the Hara, from the lower Dantian, whatever you want to call it, the navel point. And so what we're going to do is that the first sound we're going to make, we're going to be pulling that in. So be pulling in the navel point, the belt line. And again, this is the first pressure up. And then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be moving our awareness. And a Yogi Bhajan likes to say it's a three and a half circle rotation or spiral or helices or helix as we move up the spine. So by the time we get to the last portion of this mantra, our awareness is above the head. So and I'm going to break this apart for you. So the words are as follows. And I'm going to put these on the screen so you can see them uh, because my pronunciation is probably marginal. So the first sec section is ek is the first sound. And with ek, ek, what you're going to do is you're going to pull in your belt line. So again, it sets that base pressure. And then it's ong, O-N-G. And ong is an interesting sound. They use this a lot in Kundalini Yoga um, because it resonates up in here. It resonates up in the third eye point. It resonates in what they call the cella tersica. And within the cella tersica, I believe it's the, the pituitary gland hangs down there. So we're essentially vibrating the pituitary gland when you make the sound ong because O-N-G, the tongue will hit the roof of the mouth and you create a vibration up in your sinus when you make the sound. So the sound essentially comes out the nose. So it's ek on kar. And so it's ek on kar. Now the final part of that first section of the mantra, and this, this happens with, the, with two of the other sections as well, there's a hyphen and an A. So it's ek on kar. Ah. So this ah uh, sound, uh, what we're doing is as you make that sound ah, uh, and you can think about it as a UH, you can think of it as an AH, you can think about it just as an A. Uh, but what it does is that when you exhale, particularly when you exhale forcefully, what it does is it pulls the diaphragm up. So if you exhale all your air out, which is the only way to really can truly contract your core fully because the diaphragm is up out of the way underneath the ribs. So when you make that sound, uh, the diaphragm will go up under the ribs. So that is the second level of hydraulics. So one, two. And so on the ek onkara, where your awareness is going to be is down here. On the second part of the mantra, it, your awareness is going to be up around the ribs in the heart area. So I would just say kind of solar plexus, ribs. Uh, this meditation is interesting because what we're doing is we're traversing these what they call yogic, yogic knots. Um, the yogic knots, well, I don't want to get into too much detail about them, but they're essentially areas where there are energetic restrictions naturally. So there's a yogic knot here. So when, you're, when your speech is unauthentic, energy doesn't flow correctly. There's a yogic knot across the brow point, and that knot is caused by, you know, well, the way I perceive it is too much external focus. Your mind's too busy, etc. You're uh, essentially, you're mired in material existence. And it's not until you relinquish the tendency to uh, depend on the eyes to see that the inner seeing starts to happen. So, and again, what we're doing with all these, uh, this particular exercise, we're traversing all these knots. So next section is uh, Satanama. So it's, and again, I'll, I'll put this all on the screen. And then the final section in what was satanama, your again your awareness is through here. Then siriwa, awareness is up through here. And then the final section is your awareness is going to go up above the crown. So you want to bring the awareness above the crown, and you want to relax your belly. And then it's hey guru. Then it's inhale again. Awareness back down to the navel. So in a lot of ways, what we're doing is we're creating an orbit. 
So we're moving up, 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 up through this hydraulic process, making these sounds. And then we're inhaling and moving back down to the navel to repeat the process again. Mudra. Hand position, just simply prayer pose. You can have the hands out in front of the chest. The eyes, hmm, I don't see, yeah, I don't see where it specifies. So, oh, wait, yeah, yes, he does. He says, uh, focus on the brow point. So otherwise your eyes are closed, slightly rolled up, and it's like you're gazing at the brow point, or if you follow the brow point in towards the center of the head, and that's where you want to kind of set your gaze. So I'm going to go ahead and do this mantra so you can hear what it sounds like. So once again, bring the hands into a prayer. Pull up nice and tall. You want to push your sit bones down firmly. Begin by exhaling all the air out. Inhale, deep breath. And you're going to begin once again by pulling in the belt line. Heck. Onkara Satanama Siriwa He Guru Ek Onkara Satanama Siriwa Hey Guru. And then to finish this meditation, inhale, you retain the breath. Mm, think about 10 to 20 seconds, and you want to you could repeat this up to two to three times. Exhale and relax. Now the total duration of time you want to do this meditation is that the book says 31 minutes. Uh, my suggestion is you want to kind of start off slow. It's not a difficult meditation. Um, so, I mean, 11 minutes is, is, would be an easy enough start point, in my opinion. So, again, you want to start with kind of a 3 minutes, build to 11, then eventually build up to 31. And I'll go ahead and read the quick comment that Yogi Bhajan says at the bottom of the page, because I think it's relevant. It says, This extraordinary Leia Yoga chant will bring your soul and destiny present. It will suspend you above conflicts attracted by success in the activity of the positive mind. Sounds a little like Leo, if I'm to think about Leo characteristics, just a little bit. Uh, it will let you, excuse me, it will let your activity serve your purpose. It will make you creative and focused on your real priorities and help you sacrifice what is needed to accomplish them. So with all that said, I hopefully you enjoyed this video and I appreciate you watching.